Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday edition of Hear Me Out. I'm your host, Spencer Dimitros. On our Sunday show, we focus on matters of Christian faith and how God's Word applies to our everyday lives. So I want to start by wishing everyone a Happy New Year. And before we get into today's topic, which is giving to the needy, I thought I'd share with you my New Year's resolution for 2024. My resolution starts with my firm belief that our country needs to get back on track. For decades, our nation has turned its back on God, and as a result, the United States has been on a steady decline morally, economically, and politically. And here's the important point. In less than just 10 months, we're going to be electing the next president of the United States, and he or she will be setting the course for America's future at a very critical time. So my New Year's resolution is to devote a big chunk of my time to researching the candidates and their positions on the key issues, but from a Christian perspective. And then I'll share with you what I gather at the top of every Sunday edition show. As of right now, my mind is far from made up on which candidates I would support. And in the interest of full disclosure, I did vote for Donald Trump in the last two elections. But I have serious reservations about his candidacy this year. Also in the interest of full disclosure, I haven't always voted Republican. I voted for Bill Clinton in 1992 and Barack Obama in 2012. But on Donald Trump, I've heard so many people, even those close to me, say that they just don't understand how anyone with half a brain could have voted for him. So let me explain at least why I voted for him in the past, despite his many flaws. Prior to 2016, I thought of Donald Trump as a bit of a joke but that could be said for a lot of celebrities. I knew he was a real estate developer and was a total media hog. And my wife and I used to watch The Apprentice when we first got married, and we used to laugh at how arrogant and obnoxious he was, but we liked the show. At that time, if somebody had told me that I one day would vote for him for president, I would have said they were crazy. A decade or so later, in 2015, when I first heard Trump was running for president, I thought what most other people thought at the time, which was he didn't seriously want to be president. It was all just a publicity stunt. But then came his speech in June 2015, the one after he rode down the escalator in the lobby of Trump Tower. He didn't mince words, and I I liked that. He talked about how China, Japan, and Mexico were taking our jobs and killing us in the trade wars, and what he would do to change all that. He also talked about things like job creation, cleaning up our healthcare system, and being smarter about when and how to deploy our armed forces overseas. His positions on all these issues resonated with me. But the issue that really caught my attention was his focus on immigration. He said that our country was being destroyed by the millions of illegal immigrants that were flooding into the U.S. from Mexico. Even before that speech, I already believed that our southern border was a disaster and that the billions of dollars that the U.S. was spending on managing, caring for, and educating illegal immigrants was devastating to our country's future. So on that issue alone, I started to take Trump seriously as a candidate. Following that speech, the mainstream media excoriated Trump for saying that Mexico wasn't just sending good people to the U.S. illegally, but also bad people, like drug dealers and rapists. Those were Trump's words. The press then accused Trump of being racist. They also went on a fact-checking rampage, quoting all kinds of statistics, things like crime rates among illegal immigrants versus non-immigrants. But Trump didn't seem phased by any of it. But more importantly, neither did the American people. That's because everyone knew the point he was making, that our immigration laws are designed to vet the immigrants who we let into this country. The point of these laws is to allow people in who will serve our national interests, or at least not threaten our national security. And if our leaders turn a blind eye to enforcing these laws, bad people are inevitably going to come into the United States in alarming numbers. That's what he was saying, and all of it was true. But the mainstream media blew it all out of proportion, trying to make Trump into a villain, just for telling the truth. And as he gained popularity as a candidate, the media got more and more aggressive in their campaign to bring Trump down. 
I found myself siding with him because he didn't worry about being politically correct. He just said what he believed. And he didn't kowtow to the press and other progressives who didn't just disagree with Trump, but wanted to disqualify him because he didn't fit the mold of a carefully filtered establishment politician. And the more the progressives try to cancel him, the more steam his campaign received from regular Americans who agreed with his position on the issues. I'm going to tell you a story about the day of Barack Obama's first inauguration, which has some relevance to all of this. It was on January 20th, 2008. Our twins were in kindergarten at the time. They came home from school that day and told me that their elementary school rounded everyone up in the auditorium and they watched Obama's inauguration on TV. And the school administration explained to the kids what a momentous and wonderful event that was, that the first ever African American had been elected to the presidency. And my wife and I were truly pleased that our kids got to experience that. And we were really glad that the school took time out from reading, writing, and arithmetic to celebrate with the kids this critical milestone in our nation's history. But then, eight years later, my kids came home from school with a very different story. It was November 9, 2016, the day after Trump was elected. Our twins told me that many of the teachers in their public elementary school had a somber and angry tone throughout the day. And one teacher, in fact, told the students that if any one of them mentioned one word about the election, they would be held after school in detention. They were forbidden from even mentioning it. I can't tell you how much that bothered me for so many reasons. Something else bothered me that took place that same day, on the morning of November 9th. I remember driving to work and wondering how NPR was going to report on the aftermath of Trump's election. I always liked NPR, but felt that the station had a very noticeable liberal bias in how they reported the news. So I was really curious to see how they were going to report on Trump's victory. I figured, I'm sure they didn't like it, but there's no way around reporting on it. When I turned on the radio, NPR had a correspondent in a bar in Russia asking the people, presumably as they sipped their vodka, what they thought about Trump's election into office. And most, if not all, talked about how happy they were about it. I thought this was very petty of NPR. Of all things to report, first thing in the morning following Trump's victory, they obviously were hinting, not very subtly, at some tie between Trump and Russia. But little did I know that this was just foreshadowing the Trump-Russia hoax that the mainstream press, Congress, and the FBI perpetuated for the entire term of the Trump presidency. All in all, I think Trump did a decent job as president, despite the clear agenda of the progressives to basically sabotage Trump's election by making it nearly impossible for him to get anything done. But on the question of whether Trump is the right person for 2024, I do have my doubts. I think all too often he let himself take the bait of those who are going after him by getting down in the muck with them. And you can't ignore the fact that he is a lightning rod for controversy and drama, which are not good qualities for a president. Also, he does bear some responsibility for getting a lot of people to not just disagree with him, but despise him making a lot of enemies, even in his own party. So we'll see how things unfold. And I'll pray that the Lord guide us as we make our way through this election year so that we get the right person to lead our nation during this critical time. Well, enough about politics for today. Let's turn to the spiritual topic of today's show, serving others and giving to the needy. In Luke chapter 3, verse 11, Jesus says, If you have two coats, give one to someone who doesn't have any. And if you have plenty of food, give some to a person that has none. But what exactly does that call us to do in our everyday lives? And does our obligation to give to the needy apply to us as a nation? In other words, is the government supposed to take on the role of philanthropist? And if so, who are the beneficiaries? Just Americans or the entire world? We're going to tackle these questions and see what God's Word has to say about them and much more. So please stay tuned. There's a growing body of evidence that performing acts of kindness for other people actually benefits the giver, not just spiritually and emotionally, but even physically. 
Study after study have shown that giving to others elevates the levels of chemicals in our brains, what's called neurotransmitters, like serotonin, dopamine, and endorphins, that can actually increase your life expectancy. It also reduces physical pain, lowers blood pressure, and reduces stress. The data proves that performing acts of charity and service, without question, also increases self-esteem, improves mood, and enhances feelings of pleasure, satisfaction, and overall happiness. But Jesus tells us that there's an even greater benefit to helping those in need. He says in Luke chapter 12, verse 33, sell what you have and give to the needy. Make for yourself treasures in heaven that thieves can't steal and moths can't destroy. For where your treasure is, so your heart will be. So Jesus' gospel and a ton of scientific evidence leave no doubt about it. Kindness, charity, and service to others is the golden ticket to health and happiness, both in this life and the next. But is it really that simple? John chapter 12 tells the story of Mary Magdalene who poured a very expensive perfume, pure nard, on Jesus' feet. Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, asked, why wasn't the perfume sold so that the money could be given to the poor? Judas was apparently hoping that the money would get into the right hands, basically his own. But Jesus responded that Mary did something beautiful. She anointed Jesus' body in preparation for his death. And more to the point, Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. In other words, you'll never eliminate poverty here on earth. So giving away everything you have isn't always the right answer. Like many things in this world, it depends on the circumstances. But how do we know how much we're supposed to give to others and how much we should be keeping for ourselves? If we gave away everything, we probably couldn't survive. So where do we draw the line? And precisely what sorts of charity and service should we do? In order to answer that question, we have to start by looking at how we, as human beings, are wired. We're all born with a survival instinct. That's what drives our desire for things like comfort, security, self-preservation, and pleasure. Most of us are also born with a desire to do right by the people around us. At its core, it's not something we're taught, but we come into this world with an innate sense of morality, of wanting to be a good person. But because there's this tension between our desire to do good and our survival instinct, we're constantly being pulled in opposite directions. And what complicates things even more is that the demands placed on us by the people around us seem to have no limit. The more we're willing to give, the more the world will ask of us. So what do we do? Well, we could devote our entire lives to satisfying the needs of other people. That's one option. At least nobody could accuse us of being selfish. But the problem with that is, if you leave nothing for yourself, you'd probably turn into one of those people who complain that they do so much for everyone else and no one appreciates them. And of course, having a bitter attitude defeats the purpose of trying to do good in the first place. So instead of giving everything away, maybe we should just try on our own to strike a balance between altruism and self-interest. We could resolve to do our best to be good people and help others whenever we can, within reason. That sounds good, but behind closed doors and in the inner recesses of our hearts, we're all sinners. We all struggle with things like pride, selfish ambition, greed, and jealousy. So in light of our sinful tendencies, trying to parse out how and when we give to others while addressing our own needs, in a world filled with stress, competition, and never-ending demands on us, is just an exercise in futility. So maybe we as Christians should come up with a percentage of how much we're supposed to give. But what would that be? Exactly how much does God want from us? Does he want 5% of our time and money? How about 10%? We know that's what the church says we should give. Or how about half of everything we have? Is that enough? Well, the correct answer is none of the above. God isn't focused on our time or our money. What he really wants is us. He wants our entire selves. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Give yourself completely to God. Ideally, he wants Christ-like perfection. We need to hand over to him not just what we have or what we can do, but he wants us, all of us. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61 says, 
Let your heart be fully devoted to the Lord our God. Fully, that means surrendering everything, our minds, our bodies, and our very souls to God. It also means devoting ourselves to fulfilling His individual plan for our lives. If we do that, God will guide us to whatever form of service He wants from us. And in return, we'll have eternal life, joy, and fulfillment. But the first step is taking that brave leap of faith and surrendering your life to God. But here's the good news. If you're being honest with yourself and you open your eyes and ears to what's happening around you, you'll realize that you're not giving up much. You'll no longer be a prisoner to the world's biggest lie, that things like money, popularity, career success, or earthly pleasures bring you lasting joy. They don't. They're just the devil's decoys that'll divert your attention away from our Lord and Savior, the only source of true joy, hope, and eternal life. You know, I recently took our twins to the annual Army-Navy football game, which was played at Gillette Stadium here in Massachusetts this year. It was a great game, although, you know, we were rooting for Navy and they lost to Army 17 to 11. But I have to say, I was so grateful that my kids got to experience the honor and awesome traditions of both services, both Army and Navy. It was incredibly moving. In fact, during the opening ceremonies, my son Christopher turned to me and said, Dad, doesn't this make you proud to be an American? I can't tell you how happy I was to hear him say that, and of course I agreed. But what was happening on the field was very different from what was happening in the stands. We were sitting in an area with a fair number of people who had more than one or two beers, and their behavior got in the way of what should have been an entirely wholesome sporting event. It was sad to see so many grown-ups acting like out-of-control adolescents you know, using bad language, and in some cases being confrontational and aggressive. And I don't mean to pick on the Army-Navy game specifically. It's no different from what happens around our country every day at sporting events and other public and pi private get-togethers. It's a symptom of a culture that has lost its way. As a nation, we've turned our backs on God, and as a result, we can't see that we're heading further and further down a dark sinkhole. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah who said, You will see and not perceive, for this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are dull of hearing, and they have closed their eyes. And it's easy to forget that underlying this herd mentality and public display of embarrassing behavior are individual souls, people whose hearts have been broken by the pain and challenges of this world. People who can't see that they're living lives that are bringing them nothing but emptiness and despair. Or I'm sure some of them do reflect on that, but just don't know where to turn. Either way, for each and every one of those lost souls, and for every one of us, there is hope. So before we get to the question of how we should serve others, we need to transform ourselves and step into God's light of joy and healing. We need to ask Jesus into our hearts and surrender ourselves entirely to our Heavenly Father. But it's all or nothing. You can't hedge your bets or keep a foot in both camps. That just doesn't work. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, you're either with me or against me. It does take a leap of faith to surrender your entire self to God. But here's the good news. If you do, you'll inherit eternal life, joy, and peace. As Jesus said in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you're watching this now and you're struggling, or just worn out by life in general, then open your heart and ask Jesus in. If you do, that burden will be lifted and you'll enter God's rest. And then God will let you know the specific purpose he has for your life and how you can help and serve others. You'll also experience the joy, peace, and fulfillment that God promises to all of his children. If you haven't already taken that first step and taken God's hand, let today be that day. So the next question is, what about our country? Is it appropriate for America to use its limited resources to help people who just can't make it on their own in the name of charity and goodwill? Is that one of the roles that government should even be taking on? 
Well, that question should be answered the same way as any other issue facing our nation's leaders. They should make rational and informed decisions with God's guidance. Of course, there are a lot of people who would strongly object. They'd say, wait a minute, that's unconstitutional. What about the separation of church and state? I'm sure they'd argue, our elected officials can't consult the Bible when deciding how to run our country. Well, before we reject that out of hand, let's take a look at it. Let's start with our founding fathers, the people who actually created the United States at the beginning. They established our country on the principle that we are one nation under God. That's what they believed. And they were guided by God's word and Christian values in establishing how our nation should be governed. That's also true of the majority of our U.S. presidents throughout history. But does that necessarily mean that Christianity or any other religion is or should ever become the established religion of the United States? Well, of course the answer is no. That would be unconstitutional. The First Amendment specifically provides that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. But this prohibition would also preclude atheism from being the national legislated religion. And don't kid yourself, atheism definitely is a religion. People who don't believe in God or the existence of an afterlife have a very different view on why we exist and how we should conduct ourselves here on earth. And there has been a movement in the United States in the past several decades to have godlessness prevail as the established religion of our country. That's being achieved by anti-God and anti-Christian advocates that have been pushing the lie that voting into office leaders who are guided by their faith is promoting either crazy extremists, hate mongers, or at least violating the Constitution. But here is where they're wrong. Nobody can dispute that the actions of every person are influenced by whether or not they believe in God or an afterlife. And the idea that only the godless are qualified to lead our country has no foundation in law or logic. But yet, we're letting that viewpoint prevail, and it's destroying our country. As Christians, it's okay for us to be unapologetic in electing leaders who are devoted to God and the values that made our country great. Values like justice, freedom, respect for the law, equality, as well as commitment to the common good. Values and principles that, up until recently, made America a beacon of hope for the rest of the world to see and emulate. But there's a paradox we have to recognize. As devout Christians, the actions we must take as individuals sometimes aren't the same actions we should take collectively as a nation. Today, since we're talking about service and charity, that's a perfect example of what each of us must do individually that doesn't apply to our government. For all the reasons we talked about earlier, God commands each of us to serve the poor and give to those in need. When we do that as private citizens, those who receive God's grace through our acts of charity feel blessed and grateful for the kindness shown to them. Being the recipient of loving care from fellow human beings acts as a catalyst. It inspires those receivers to turn their lives to God, work their way out of poverty, and restore hope for a successful and happy life. On the other hand, government entitlements have the exact opposite effect. They create financial incentives for welfare recipients to remain unemployed and therefore stay forever in poverty. And the entitlements increase as they have more and more children out of wedlock, which is generally not good for the children. And instead of feeling grateful for those who sacrifice to help them out, recipients of government entitlements are led to believe that they have a legal right to have their needs paid for by taxpayers who have to work to make ends meet. That's not to say that welfare recipients are in an enviable position. Their lives are more like being in prison. They and the generations that follow are often captive in a state of dependence and hopelessness that they sometimes never escape. Our welfare system is not one of love or compassion, but is one of entrapment. True love and compassion are expressed by each of us individually when we give freely and generously to those in need of our help. And the reality is, if America continues to operate as a welfare state or the world's financial benefactor or police force, our nation simply cannot survive. In fact, we never should have started down that road in the first place. Our national debt, the amount of money the United States has borrowed and must pay back, is currently $34 trillion. 
According to data from the Pew Research Center on the current number of taxpayers, that's over $300,000 of debt for every single taxpayer. And last year alone, the United States paid $659 billion just on interest on the debt. Let's not forget God's word cautions against borrowing money irresponsibly. The most glaring example of why the U.S. cannot be the world's philanthropist is our current immigration crisis. Our nation's leaders have turned a blind eye to the millions of migrants flooding into our country illegally, all in the name of benevolence. And that is decimating our cities and threatening our country's financial condition, as well as our national security. The obvious reality is, the failure to secure our borders and refusal to deport those who are here illegally has not and cannot put a dent in global poverty or end all forms of oppression by evil dictators abroad. It has only succeeded in harming our nation and the American people. The people who are leaders were elected to serve, protect, and defend. These are not the actions of mercy or compassion. They are acts of weak leadership. That is not to say that we should turn our backs on those suffering in other countries, but the obligation to share what we have and help in any way we can falls on each of us individually. Charity doesn't just begin at home, it needs to end there too. My own experience on this issue starts with my grandparents. All four of them immigrated to the United States from Greece through Ellis Island at the turn of the 20th century. They started out with nothing, and like many of the Greek immigrants, they spoke little or no English and looked different from the people who were already here. As a result, they weren't always treated well. The Greek immigrants were often called dirty Greeks or greaseballs. But they took whatever jobs they could to make a living. My one grandfather sold candy bars on the street, and my other grandfather cleaned hats. But they felt blessed to be here and, like many immigrants, made their way out of poverty, bought houses, and raised families. They also sent what little extra money they had back to their families left behind in what they called the old country. My mother once told me that she remembered from when she was little that my grandmother, Yaya used to tell her cousins in Greece to trace the outlines of their children's feet every year and send the outlines to her. My grandmother would then use them to buy shoes, which she sent back to Greece for the kids. It was really nice. My mom and dad finally got to visit Greece for the first time when they were in their 70s. And they met these relatives who they had never laid eyes on before. My mom told me that when she walked into the house, it was really emotional. They hugged and just sobbed. I'm sure part of the reason was because the cousins were so grateful for my grandparents' kindness, sending shoes and money and other things all those years. It was very cool. One of the kids was named after my grandfather, Savas in Greek, who I was also named after. The point of all this is, God gave us a loving heart for a reason. It's so that we take care of others, and not just our own family, but people who need our help, who we have no connection to, and even our enemies. But God didn't just give us a heart. He also gave us a brain. So we need to act rationally and not let our leaders confuse kindness and compassion with irresponsible spending, emotional decision-making, and weak leadership. Our prayer for this week is for God to help us to be kind, humble, and loving, but also strong and courageous, both as individual Christians and as a nation. We'll be right back. Well, that's our show for today. I would love to hear from you, so drop me a note on our show's website at watchhearmeout.com. And I hope everyone has a happy and healthy 2024, and we'll see you next week.